I'd like to welcome you back for our second session together. Previously, we were discussing the holiness of God. This time, I want to follow up with that to talk about our pursuit of holiness. And as we begin this time together, I want to share with you a passage from Dr. Sproul's book, The Holiness of God. It comes near the end of the book. It's in a chapter entitled, Holy Space and Holy Time. And as Dr. Sproul is bringing this, this wonderful book to a conclusion, he tells us this, Christianity is not about involvement with religious experience as a tangent. It involves a meeting with a holy God who forms the center or core of human existence. The Christian faith is theocentric. God is not at the edge of Christians' lives, but at the very center. God defines our entire life and our worldview. Uh, what Dr. Sproul is telling us there is that the pursuit of holiness, the, the living of the Christian life, what theologians will call sanctification, is not something that's just a tangent for us. It's not something that's out there on the margins of the lives we live. It is not something we do occasionally, and it is certainly not something we only do one day a week or one hour of one day a week. But when we truly grasp who God is in His holiness, and we understand what being a Christian is all about, we realize that God is at the very center of our lives that God is at the very core of our existence. And sort of like the hub of a wheel that has those spokes that extend outward, so it is that God in His holiness is not only at the center of our lives, He permeates every area and aspect of our lives all the way through. It is one way of saying that when we become a Christian, we become entirely devoted to pursuing God. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about the Christian life. We're talking about the pursuit of holiness. Now, I've mentioned this is referred to as sanctification. And when theologians speak of sanctification, they'll sometimes speak of three aspects or, or three dimensions to sanctification. That first dimension is what theologians will call positional sanctification. That is, in Christ, I am holy. I have all of the holiness I will ever need because it's Christ's righteousness. It's Christ's holiness, and that is perfect. When Paul or the other New Testament authors write their epistles to the early Christians, they'll call them saints. We are all saints. We are holy ones. We are all holy in Christ Jesus. And so we are positionally sanctified. There's also a sense in which we have a perfect sanctification or a future glorification to come. And that is when we reach the end of our lives or when Christ comes back, we will be glorified. We will be made pure and holy. Uh, the American Puritan Jonathan Edwards spoke of us as being clogged in our earthly life. Uh, we still have remaining sin that acts like a clog. You know, that, that sink that just won't drain and there's that water always in the bottom of it and until you go and you get the plunger and you have to work at that drain to, to get that clog out so that it flows freely. Well, sin is like a clog in us. But Edward says, when we get to heaven, we will be un 
clogged. Uh, We will be able to love God perfectly and purely, and we will love others perfectly and purely. There is coming a time when we will be entirely free from sin, free from its power, and free from its consequences. As we read at the end of Revelation, that God is not just making us new, but that God is making all things new. And so we long for that, and we look for that. That's our future sanctification. So we have our positional sanctification. We are holy. Uh, We can stand before a righteous God, the judge of all the earth, because of what Christ has done. And someday we will be entirely free from sin. We will have our glorified bodies. and We won't have this body of corruption, this tent, as Paul calls it. But in between is what we call progressive sanctification. In between our conversion and our glorification is living the Christian life. Now, throughout church history, there have been different views of sanctification. Uh, Some have held to what is called the higher life view. And so they believe that you can reach a, a, a plateau in this life where you have love perfected in your life, that you can reach a place of perfection in this life. This is sometimes associated with the Wesleyan or the Methodist approach to sanctification or Methodism. There's another version of this in England that was referred to as the Keswick movement that spoke of the pursuit of the higher life. And in the early 20th century, starting in Azusa Street, California, but spreading very quickly and now massively spread all around the world, is what we sometimes call old-style assemblies of God or Pentecostalism. And that view held that there were those who were Christians, but they had not yet received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And when they did receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, they now are sort of super-Christians who are elevated on this plane of the higher Christian life. And the sign that they have the baptism of the Holy Spirit is speaking in tongues. So church history is is full of views of sanctification that are not biblical and not helpful. The, The classic Augustinian view or the Reformed view of sanctification is the idea that when we are saved, yes, we are regenerated. We we have a new heart. One way to think of this is, is how we were sort of oriented away from God. So before we were Christians, God is here and, and our whole lives are sort of oriented away from him. We are going in the opposite direction of God. But when we are converted, we do a full 180 degree turn. And now our lives are towards God. In fact, repentance is the idea of a turning away from. And so that away from is the pursuit of idols or the pursuit of sin or the pursuit of life without God. Repentance is to turn from that, from wickedness, and to turn to a living God. And so at our conversion, at our salvation, we can now move towards God and serve Him. We are given new eyes to see the truth of Scripture. Uh, Before we were saved, it was as as if we had blinders over our eyes. Uh, We couldn't see. You know, I remember when I was in college and I I took an astronomy class, and 
we went out to some field somewhere late at night and it was during a, a cycle of the moon that was very light. So there wasn't much natural light in the sky and Professor had this wonderful telescope and put it out there and it was really the first time I'd ever looked through a high powered telescope and the setting was, was just perfect for this. There wasn't much natural light around us. And with that telescope, you could just see so many things in the sky. You could, you could make out the rings of Saturn that you just could not see with the human eye without a telescope. And so with our unregenerate eyes, it's, it's as if we're reading the Bible without a telescope. Uh, an unregenerate person and a regenerate person are reading the same words on the page but a regenerate person sees it, sees the truth of it, sees the beauty of it, sees it for what it is, in fact, a revelation, a true revelation of the true God. So we are now oriented towards God. We have new eyes to see and to read God's word. We have a new heart. We have a new life. Uh, we have the gift of the Holy Spirit. We, we have the gift of fellow Christians. We have all these benefits that we did not have before our regeneration, before our salvation. And so in the Augustinian Reformed view, we recognize that we are now a new creature and that we have the ability and the capacity and we are given the means to live a life that is obedient and pleasing to God. And we did not have those abilities, nor those capacities, nor those means when we were in our unregenerate, unsaved state. And so here's the first principle of the traditional Augustinian Reformed view of sanctification. We can pursue holiness. We have the ability to do that. Now, I know what you're thinking, and you're going to say, hold on. I thought being reformed was all about recognizing what we cannot do. In fact, isn't it reformed people who love to say, you can do nothing. Uh, you're a sinner. You're, you're wallowing in your sins. And what's more, there's nothing you can do about it. We call that monergism, right? Monergism means the work of one. And so we reform people. We love to talk about salvation as monergism. It is the work of God alone. There is nothing you can do as a sinner. Remember, God is holy. You're not. There's nothing you can do about it. And when you realize that, then you are putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. We call that monergism. But when we come to living the Christian life, when we come to sanctification, we believe in synergism. S-Y-N in English, synergism. And synergism is the idea of a cooperative work. In fact, synergism is from the Greek, comes right into the English cooperate is from the Latin. They both mean the same thing. It's not a work of one, like monergism. It's a work of two, which is to say that we, as new creatures, can pursue our sanctification. Now, let's take a look at a text, and let's see what this text teaches us about sanctification. This is Paul in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Paul writes here, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things 
without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Now, if you go back to verses 12 and 13, you see very clearly that Paul is presenting salvation here as a cooperation or sanctification here as a cooperation. He tells us in verse 12, work out your own salvation. He doesn't say work for your salvation. He doesn't tell the Philippians work in order to earn your salvation. He's telling them you're saved. He's, he's referring to them as brothers and sisters in Christ. And now he is teaching them to work out that salvation. And don't miss, there's that phrase. We saw it back in Hebrews. We see it in reference to the holiness of God with fear and trembling. Even with our mediator, even though we are brought by Christ's hand into the very presence of God, we still recognize that this is the holy God. We still recognize the need for fear and trembling. Again, not a, not a fear of judgment, not feeling as if we're going to be crushed, but that idea of reverence, that idea of acknowledging God in his holiness and in his purity. But it's very clear, isn't it? We are to work out our salvation. And then Paul tells us, for it is God who works in you. So there is the cooperation. There is the synergism. Now, nowhere does Paul present salvation as synergistic. Paul always presents salvation as the work of God alone. You are dead in your trespasses and sins, and dead men and dead women can do nothing. It is the work of God that brings us to new life in Jesus Christ. It's when we realize that there's nothing that we can do. That is when we believe and trust in Jesus Christ. That is when we have no merit of our own to plead, but only Christ's merit and Christ's work and Christ's righteousness. And so one of the things we must see about sanctification in our pursuit of holiness is that we are commanded to pursue holiness because we can pursue holiness. But as we look into sanctification and as we look into Paul's writings, we look through the rest of the New Testament, we recognize that though we have this new ability, new capacity, new means at our disposal, we still have the old man or the flesh that pulls us down. We still live in this body of sin, and we still live in this world of corruption. And so while we pursue holiness, we are not in this life free from sin. But let's take a look for a moment at what pursuing holiness looks like. Now, to do that, I want to come back to Philippians chapter 2. I want to look at some of the things Paul's saying here. And also, I want to turn to 1 John chapter 3. But first, let's spend some time here in Philippians chapter 2. So the first thing that we see is, as we've already mentioned, a pursuit of holiness, sanctification is a cooperative work. We work out our salvation as God is at work in us. Uh, the second thing that we see here is very challenging for us. Uh, we see it in verse 14. 
do all things without grumbling or disputing. Now, I would have much preferred that Paul say, do most things. I would have been thrilled if Paul said, do some things. But he doesn't say those things, does he? He has that little word in there. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. Now, why is Paul talking about this? Why is he so concerned that we not be grumblers or that we not cause division and and create disputes? Because Paul recognizes how crucial it is as Christians to live a sanctified life in the community of the church. We, We shouldn't grumble And we shouldn't be given to disputing and debating and arguing because those things are detrimental to living in the body of Christ. And how easy it is for us to grumble and complain. I find myself grumbling and complaining. And I think we live at a moment in history where we have so many things at our disposal, technology has eased our lives in so many ways, and yet here we are still grumbling. Uh, We're standing at the microwave, and we can't believe how slow this is in cooking our food. We love, as human beings, it, it is part of our identity to grumble and complain. Read through the pages of the Old Testament. You find it in Israel. Here they are, brought out of Exodus, brought out of slavery in Egypt. And how do they repay God? They grumble and they complain. And those things are so disruptive. They're disruptive to a family. They're disruptive to a relationship. They're disruptive to a work environment. And they're deadly in the church of Jesus Christ. And so one of the things Paul is saying here is you want to talk about being sanctified? It has everything to do with how you live your life before other people. Being sanctified is not just some some sort of abstract list of of the essentials of being a pious person. Being sanctified gets right to the very fiber of life. Right, right to the very core of our existence, right? Right to the the very uh, essence of the relationships that we have. To not be one who's given to grumbling, not be one who's given to disputes. Paul is saying sanctification here is a very practical matter. It has to do with how we get along with one another and how we treat one another. Paul goes one step further in verse 15. He says that by doing this, you, so that, doing all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may blameless be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish. That's holiness, isn't it? That notion of without blemish, that's a reference back to the, the perfect spotless sacrifice. The lamb that was without spot or blemish. Paul's talking about holiness. Make no mistake about it. He's talking about holiness. And how necessary this is because we live in unholy times. The first century was an unholy time. The Christians stood out. Uh, The Christians were separate. The Christians were not like the world and the culture around them. Paul says that first century culture is a culture of, that is crooked, a culture that is twisted. Now, crooked, of course, means to sort of deviate from a standard. Uh, You've got straight and then you've got crooked. And how often is this used in Scripture to talk about the straight path versus the crooked path? But twisted, see, 
twisted now is to take what God has declared, take what God has designed and to pervert it, to twist it. Oh, we live in a twisted generation. You, you could talk about gender identity. You can talk about sexual orientation. And you can see how clearly our culture has twisted that which God has declared. Go read the opening chapters of Genesis, and there you will see that God created us in his image, male and female, God created them. Gender is not a social construct. Gender is inherent in the created order. And then you'll see that God made the woman for the man. God blessed and designed heterosexual marriage. That's right in these opening chapters of Genesis. And we look at the moment in which we live and we see how we are in a culture that has twisted, that has perverted that which God has declared and that which God has designed. Paul's prayer, Paul's plea for this church at Philippi, which is to say Paul's plea for us is that we live differently, that we live according to God's straight and right standard, that we not get sidetracked, that we not follow after a crooked standard, or that we follow a twisted standard, or that we begin to live lives that pursue not God's design, but an unholy design. Paul wants the church to stand out, to shine, as verse 15 says, to shine as lights in the world. Here we are back to that beautiful Reformation slogan, post tenebras looks. The Latin expression, after darkness, post tenebras looks, after darkness, light. It's a metaphor that's in scripture. To be outside of Christ, to be at enmity with God is to be in darkness. And we live in a world that is in darkness. And Paul is calling us to pursue holiness so that we can proclaim the light in a dark and dying world. We can proclaim the light of the gospel in the life of the gospel in a world that is consumed in darkness and a world that is consumed in death. You know what it's like to wander in the darkness. This happens sometimes when I travel. I, I wake up in the middle of the night. I'm in a hotel room somewhere. I'm totally disoriented. I've, I've pulled the blinds tight so that there's no light coming in and I can't see a single thing. And sure enough, I'm going to bump into something as I'm stumbling around in the darkness. That's the unregenerate person. They're stumbling around in the darkness of this world. And Paul calls us to be lights. And how are we lights? Well, we are holding fast to the word of life. There's no secret to sanctification. There's no middle of the night uh, seminar that, you know, comes on and it's going to give you the, the five keys to successful sanctification. It's very simple what sanctification here is. It is holding fast to the word of God. To be a sanctified people, a holy people, 
who serve a holy God, we must live and read and obey a holy Bible. We pursue a holy God by living by his holy word. And so Paul says, you want to know how to work out your salvation? You want to know how to be sanctified? You do it by sticking close to the word of God. You do it by committing yourself to not simply read God's word, but to study God's word. And not only we are to, to study it, but we are to delight in it and we are to obey it and we are to live it. Remember what Dr. Sproul said in that quote, the end of holiness, that holiness, as we understand what this means for us as Christians, means that God is at the center of our life, that the Christian life is not just something tangential, but it is the scope of our entire life. It is our worldview. That's what sanctification ultimately is. It is being so saturated with the Word of God, so pouring ourselves into the Word of God that we begin to think and live according to a biblical worldview. Of course, we all know and love that classic text, Pilgrim's Progress. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the, the great London preacher of the middle of the 1800s, when he was talking about Bunyan and, and Pilgrim's Progress, he was referencing how uh, Pilgrim's Progress just overflows with biblical texts. And more often than not, Bunyan is not quoting scripture. He's, he's simply referring to it and alluding to it. And what that underscores and, and what Spurgeon picks up from that is that Bunyan had so allowed the Word of God to permeate him that the Bible just sort of permeated out through his writings. He didn't need to go look up a verse. It was just part of his mental furniture. It was part of his makeup. And, and as he was writing Pilgrim's Progress, biblical allusions just spilled out onto the page. Spurgeon then says, go up to Bunyan, and, and prick him anywhere. You know, if you were to take a little needle and you were to just to prick his skin, Spurgeon says, prick him anywhere and his blood is bibline. He bleeds the Bible. That the Bible is part of who John Bunyan is. And it comes out in Pilgrim's Progress. Wouldn't that... Or shouldn't that be true of all of us? That we are so holding fast this word of God that we have allowed the Bible to permeate us so that you prick us anywhere and we bleed bibline. The word of God just comes out. Notice too that Paul tells us to hold fast to the word of God. There's something to that. It's, it's April of 2021. This is very important because this is the 500th anniversary month of Luther's stand at the Diet of Worms. And there, as he stood at Worms before the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V and before the, the papal delegation, all decked out in their robes and jewels and hats. And, and there's Luther in his simple monk's tunic, Luther, contra mundum, the, the single monk against the world, against the powers of the emperor in his throne and against the powers of the church. There's Luther. And what does he declare at Worms? My conscience is captive to the word of God. That Luther, in that moment of challenge where he was put to the test, Luther held fast and stood firm. My conscience is captive to the word of God, Luther says. To go against our conscience is neither safe for us nor open 
to us, here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. Amen. Uh, We live in this moment where God's word is constantly challenged. We live in an age where there is a dismissal of anything that is old, out with the old, in with the new. Why would we pay attention to a book that is 2,000 years old? Well, in this moment, in this time, we must hold fast to the word of God. To have that same conviction of Luther to say, here I stand. Because this is God's word, and this alone is the light of salvation in the darkness. This is what Paul says in verse 16, holding fast to the word of life. This precious word of light and life in this world of death and darkness. Well, we have what Paul teaches us. In Philippians chapter 2, I want to add one more text as we think about sanctification, we think about the pursuit of holiness. It's 1 John chapter 3. As we come to 1 John chapter 3, I want to look at just the opening three verses with you. In these three verses, John adds another dimension to this notion of the pursuit of holiness. And I think it simply boils down to this. We must know who we are. And then from that, we know what we must do. So let's take a look at it. At verse 1 of chapter 3, John writes, and this is 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, John writes, See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God. And so we are. See what John is doing here? He's, he is so caught up in our identity. He is so caught up in this beautiful truth that we are the children of God. He he could have just said that that the Father has given us, that we should be called the children of God. But he, but he comes alongside of it, and he, and he emphasizes this, and he adds, and so we are. He's, he's reaching across the page to us, and he's telling us, you are a child of God. Who are you? You are God's. And you became God's because of God's love. In fact, he opens it with, see what kind of love God has for us. What was required for us to become the children of God? What was required was that God sent his only beloved son to die on a cross for our sins. What love the Father has for us. The cost for us to become the children of God is the precious blood of Jesus Christ. This is who we are. John says the reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. It did not know Jesus Christ, this this one who who was the cost for God's love to us. And John saw it. He, He saw it with his very eyes that Jesus was rejected when he offered himself as the sacrificial lamb. He saw it when Jesus said, I am the door. When Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. When Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. When Jesus said, my burden is easy and my yoke is light. When Jesus said, I came into this world 
to forgive this world. And what happened? John saw it. He was rejected. And so John is telling us as Christians that we too will be rejected because we are God's children. In other words, he's, he's telling us, this is a wonderful truth, uh, that we are the children of God. But he's also telling us in this context of reminding us that in this world, we will be, as disciples of Jesus, rejected because the master was rejected. We will, in this world, have challenges because the master was challenged. And no disciple is, is greater than the master. But he continues, verse 2, Behold, we are God's children now. This is our current identity. Uh, we belong to God. We are his. We are his child. And what we will be has not yet appeared. So this is who we are now, but who will we be? See, he's, he's talking about that future glorification. He's talking about that future perfect sanctification. He says, we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. Here it is. Uh, this is that wonderful word that is that summative word of what the Christian life is all about. It's all about transformation. As Paul tells us at one point, we are transformed from one degree of glory to another. That's progressive sanctification. That's growing in holiness. That's pursuing God and pursuing holiness. And someday we will go from degrees of transformation to that total and complete transformation. Uh, we will no longer have any veil. We will no longer, as, as Jonathan Edwards said, we will no longer be clogged by sin. But we shall see him face to face. And, and we will not be pulverized. Uh, we will not be somehow overtaken by the, the, the luminosity of the glory of God and the perfection of his being that we would be turned aside, but we will be able to gaze upon the face of God because we will be free, totally, entirely, utterly free from sin. Right now, we are children of God. Uh, right now, we live in, in a challenging time where we may very well be rejected and face persecution but there will come a day when we will be truly transformed, entirely transformed, holy and like him. And notice what John says in verse 3 as an implication of all this. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. So there it is, not the word, but the concept holiness. And so the living of the Christian life is purification, is becoming more and more progressively sanctified, made holy. That, that word sanctified literally means to be set apart, to, to be taken from, from common and ordinary profane usage and to be set apart. So the vessels, the, the instruments that would be in the tabernacle, in the temple, they were sanctified so that they could be used for holy purposes in the worship of a holy God. The priest would be sanctified so that the priest covered in, in the blood of the spotless lamb 
could enter into the presence of God, could be sanctified and made of holy use. That's what living the Christian life is all about. It's about the transformation of our lives from the mundane and the profane and the common to be a vessel that is set apart for the Holy One, for God. And God has not hidden from us the means by which we are sanctified. He's given us those means. It is by holding fast to his word. It is by studying his word. It is by living according to his word. Even if everyone else around us is denying it and rejecting it and ridiculing it and dismissing it. We live according to God's word. God has given us the gift of prayer so that we pray for our transformation. We pray for our growth. We pray for that help that we need from God. God has given us the means of grace, of the sacraments, of of baptism, and of the Lord's Supper. Uh, Wasn't it Luther, your very own Luther, who said we are battled every day throughout the whole week. We are in a battle for our lives. And then we come into church and we have the nourishment of the Lord's Supper. The reminder of the body that was broken and the blood that was shed and a reminder that we are Christ's. We have the means of grace and we have the preaching of the word and we have fellowship with one another. We're not in this alone. We are in this together and we are in the Christian life together as we bear one another's burdens, as we encourage one another, as we intercede and pray for one another to grow in holiness. Because, friends, mein Bruder und Schwestern, my brothers and sisters in Christ, we serve a holy God. We are called by a holy God. We are called by a God who is dwelling in purity. We think of the description of God and his throne in heaven in the book of Revelation, and we can see the sheer luminosity of it as it comes off of the pages of scripture. We serve a holy God, a pure God. And this holy God has called us to a life of holiness and purity. We will not be free from sin until we leave this earth or until Christ comes back. But as we live for him, may we seek to be transformed from one degree of glory to another, from one degree of purity to another. Uh, Yes, even from one degree of holiness to another, because everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself, even as he, as God, is pure and holy. Please pray with me. Our Father and our God, we again confess that you are holy, holy, holy. We thank you that you have not left us wallowing in our sinfulness, just cut off and separated from you, but that you sent your Son as our sacrifice on our behalf We thank you that because of Christ, we can have our sins forgiven and that we can stand in your presence. We thank you that you have given us the gift of your word, that you've given us the gift of the Holy Spirit, that you've given us the gift of the church, that you've given us the gift of the Lord's Supper, the gift of prayer. May we not neglect these gifts, but may we wholeheartedly pursue 
holiness through these gifts that you've given to us. May you, in your grace and according to your good pleasure, be at work in us, not only to save us, but to sanctify us. And may it be for your glory and for your honor alone. It is in Christ's name we pray. Amen.